lucky. And certainly my career in films started purely by luck. I think it's important, actually. It's important to be lucky. And then it's important to have the talent to use your luck. I don't think one can regret anything, really, do you? I mean, everything that's happened is fated. Is what we are. Could one ever have been different? Could you have been different? We know what we are, but we know not what we may be. You know that? Lindsay, John Cartwright, lovely to see you. Yeah. Lindsay, would you like to talk? Nice to see you, John. Yeah. Nice. Hello, Lindsay. Thanks for coming. Nice to meet you. Okay. Well, Good to see you. I'm glad we're meeting at the Cosmo. My favourite restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> now, what's this here? We've put together a package of a collection of your films. The sort of angle that we were thinking about. Uh, was the the difficulty that we have reconciling your establishment background, born in India during the Raj. Yes. But you did go to prep and public school here, uh, to Oxford. You're an officer in the military. Do you know, I don't think that this would be a big factor anywhere but in England, mm -hmm. who are so class conscious. I suppose I have been regarded for a lot of my career as a radical or a radical filmmaker, left wing. I've even been called a socialist, which I've certainly never been. That's why I've never been a member of the Socialist Party. It, it's certainly true that my background is upper class. Uh, my education has been impeccably upper middle class in Britain, born in India, where my father was a member of the British Army in India. He was an officer of the Royal Engineers. And I came back, was educated in a prep school at Worthing, at Cheltenham College, and then at Wadham College, Oxford. This is all part of the um, upper class system of education in Britain, uh, not the free education available to members of the working class. But I think it would be a mistake to think that the radical or the people who have disapproved of the class system in Britain have always come, say, from the working class. Take a character like Orwell, you know, I mean, Orwell after all was I suppose middle, upper middle class, was in the police in Burma, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Educated at Eton, mm -hmm. and was, of course, I suppose, left-wing, mm -hmm. though anti-communist. Mm -hmm. Good for him. Mm -hmm. And got into a lot of trouble. I remember very well at Cheltenham, when my form master spoke to me in a very pleasant, polite way, and I think I'd been discovered in some peccadillo, which I can't remember exactly at the moment, but he said to me, you know, Anderson, if you go on like this, you're going to be persona non grata with a great many people. And I said to him, you're probably right, sir, but I think it's too late to do anything about it. Look, it's a question of temperament, isn't it? You know, either one is, uh, by nature, critical, satirical, and that's what one is. It's, it mm. isn't that... People always have this idea, I think, that you set out to make... Um, to make a particular kind of film. 
I don't think very often that uh, artists have this idea any more than a painter when he starts painting a picture has necessarily a clear idea of what he's going to paint. Yeah. It grows as he paints, doesn't it? And I think that if it's humanly possible, that happens with them filmmaking, but it must, does make thing, things different, uh, you know, difficult mm. for critics and academics and people like yourself. <laughs> The films that I made on my own were, I suppose, first of all, uh, a little film called Oh Dreamland, which I made after Wakefield Express, and which was entirely out of my own imagination and feeling. I had seen Dreamland in Margit when I was preparing with a friend of mine, Guy Brenton, a film called Thursday's Children, which was, again, uh, not a commissioned picture, but a picture which we made together about the education of deaf children in Margate. And while in Margate, I saw Dreamland, and I thought this would make a very good film. I didn't, at this stage, make very many films. Uh, I did make Thursday's Children with Guy, and it was remarkably successful. To our great surprise, it won a, an Oscar, at the best documentary of the year, I think. And uh, as a result, I was asked to make several films for the Central Office of Information. But I really wasn't any good at making commissioned pictures. I've never been an entrepreneur. It's not something I'm proud of. I'm really not proud of it. But um, it's a gift that you have or you haven't. And um, I know that the extent to which I've made anything at all has been largely through luck. I think that a film like Old oh Dreamland, which is a very simple little film made by two people, uh, which runs for 10 minutes with all the sound recorded at Dreamland as we were shooting, does reflect my own somewhat critical, satirical temperament. And I think I've only ever been any good at making pictures that were, were personal, that did come out of my own imagination, my own sense of values. And uh, that went on to a film like Every Day Except Christmas, which was a film I was commissioned to make for the Ford Motor Company, and my friend Carol Rice, who had become in charge of production for the Ford Motor Company, he asked me to make their first 35 millimeter documentary, and I chose to make a film about Covent Garden. The film, much to our surprise, did win the Grand Prix at the Venice Documentary Film Festival, which was a great surprise to everybody and not popular with the English who didn't find again that the film I had made about Covent Garden was sufficiently proper or sufficiently shall I say upper class uh, in the way that it dealt with work people. The realism or the social realism that came in in the late 50s and early 60s was, I would say, nixed by the British public. And uh, British cinema turned over to swinging London, which was much more popular than the free cinema films, if you like, which were perhaps essentially left-wing, not popular, not liked. Both O Dreamland and Every Day Except Christmas were shown in the free cinema programs, which Carol Rice and Tony Richardson, Lorenzo Mazzetti, who'd made a film called Together, which we organized at the National Film Theater. We wanted to show these films, so we had to invent free cinema. And that's really what free cinema was. I think that in Britain, 
nobody took a great deal of notice of it. But abroad, it caught on. And there was a free cinema show, for instance, in New York. I remember hearing how a British diplomat, when being asked about free cinema in, I think it was Poland, he replied very kindly and explained that in Britain we don't show films for nothing. People have to pay to go and see films. So the term free cinema really didn't mean anything. Well, that was very typical of the British reaction. And I'm afraid the Britons have always been, and still are, to a great extent, Philistine. I mean, when, for instance, one film I would like to have made was uh, The Cherry Orchard of Chekhov, which I've done twice in the theatre. And it's very characteristic that we did, I did a script with Frank Grimes, who was an actor in the production, and we sent it to um, a television company in this country and received back a letter which was addressed to dear Mr. Chekhov and um, said, I'm afraid this isn't the kind of thing we want to make, but uh, if you write anything now in the future, do let us see it. <laughs> well, you know, of course it's funny, but it's also sad. I mean, it is the kind of world that one is dealing with. Free cinema didn't last all that long, chiefly because at home it wasn't very much talked about, and the British Film Institute, for instance, and the National Film Theatre said we couldn't give any more free cinema shows because they thought we were too left-wing, which of course was nonsensical. But fortunately after that I was invited by Tony Richardson who really was more interested or was doing more in the theatre to go to the Royal Court and become a director. And I did. I directed several plays at the court and really it was because there wasn't work in the film industry. But it was through the success of Look Back in Anger and Tony Richardson and John Osborne with their company, Woodfall Films. That was really what made the breakthrough in British cinema at the end of the 50s and the early 60s, chiefly because Tony and John made a film of Saturday night and Sunday morning, which they asked Carol Rice to direct for them. And Saturday night and Sunday morning was a huge success. It was a success commercially uh, and critically. And suddenly you found that British producers and film companies were looking for new talent, new directors, and particularly material from the North, and very much concerned with working class characters and working class life. And that is how the Rank Organization managed to get hold of David Storey's novel, This Sporting Life, and gave it to a producer called Julian Wintrell, who invited Carol Rice to direct it. Carol, as he had really come to my rescue with Every Day Except Christmas, he came to my rescue by saying that he didn't want to direct this sporting life, but he would like to have experience of production. And he came to me, who was working in the theatre at that time, and in fact I was directing uh, Albert Finney in Billy Lyre. And Carol said to me, would I consent to directing this sporting life with him as a producer? And I said, well, fine, you can try, but I don't see any reason why they should agree with this. And Carol went off to whatever meeting he had and came back a day later or a couple of days later and he said, they've agreed. And I said, well, I suppose we'll have to do it. I've no doubt that I was helped in making my first feature film by the fact that I had been working in the theatre. But certainly when I made The Sporting Life, I didn't think that I was 
making filmed theatre. I wasn't filming a play. The novel was one that I had known and liked. And my background in filmmaking was really more extensive than my background in theatre. Richard Harris had made several films before this and in fact came to Sporting Life from Mutiny on the Bounty, which by a sheer cheek he was uh, starring in. And Rachel Roberts had acted for Carol Rice in Saturday Night and Sunday Morning. Unfortunately, the film was not popular with the public, I think because it was essentially a tragedy. It was not a light film in any way, and it certainly didn't have the rather anarchic humour of, say, Saturday night and Sunday morning. Also, the rank organisation, uh, run then by John Davis, disliked the sporting life very much. And John Davis uh, made a, a pronouncement deploring the film in an extremely English way. But I would say that the critics in London did receive the sporting life extremely well. And I think that's the difference between the 60s and today. I'm pretty sure that today the film would not be received particularly well, perhaps chiefly because as the years have gone on and we've arrived at the present, the most important thing for a British film must surely be economic success, financial success in the United States. That's what gets them media attention in this country. And perhaps a certain spirit of conformism. I mean, if you look at a film at the moment, like, um, what's it, Four Weddings and a Funeral, why is that so tremendously popular? It's funny. Is it? Yeah. Did you laugh? Yeah. Because I'd met... Now, is I've that a comment on the film or on you? I've been to... I've met people. I've met just about everybody <laughs> apart from Andy... What about... You've met me. Mm. You haven't asked me <laughs> anything. <laughs> of course, the British audience has traditionally preferred American pictures to British films. And I would say that the general attitude towards the cinema by all classes in Britain has been to regard it as entertainment and to regard it as, well, certainly not an art. Understand? Uh, yeah. You agree? I think so. I think so. Of yes. course. Of Thank course. you. Well, that's very kind of you. There's one thing I would like to say about this sporting life, and that is that it is very distinctly a film of and by David Story, who wrote the novel and wrote the script. I'm not trying to get out of responsibility for the picture, which is certainly mine to the extent that it is a film. But I do think it's important that in certain films, the contribution of the scriptwriter should be noted and should be known. Of course, critics are awfully lazy. And I think it's true that with the, the academics as well, um, with, a, say, a theory like the auteur theory, which is rather simple, and you only have to quote one name in relation to a film. But there are certain films that obviously do belong very much to the world of the author, as well as to the director. The film that I made after this sporting life was a film called The White Bus, which was from a story by Sheila Delaney. And in that case, Sheila and I both worked on the script. It's a 50-minute film, which I regard as important and with a certain fondness. It was going to be part of a trilogy that was invented by Woodfall Films and was going to have uh, films by Peter Brook. And Tony Richardson also made a film called Red and Blue, and I made The White Bus. 
the trilogy, which was called Red, White and Zero, my title, was a disaster because the films didn't go together. They had originally been designed as a trilogy of films by Sheila Delaney. But when Peter Brook and Tony Richardson saw my film, The White Bus, or should I say mine and Sheila's film, The White Bus, they decided to drop their Sheila Delaney subjects and to invent something more daring of their own. The result, I'm sorry to say, was disaster. But I really do like The White Bus, also because it was the first film uh, which I worked on with the Czech cameraman, Miroslav Andrzejczyk, who came from Prague to shoot it, and we got on extremely well together. And I think that The White Bus is interesting and important, partly because it is a poetic film, if you like, and it certainly gave me an opportunity to express that side of my creativity, character, whatever you like. But it is also satirical in its style, and so was the beginning of the way of filmmaking that led to If, to O Lucky Man, and most recently to Britannia Hospital. If you want a continuity of theme, I think this is one, a mistrust of institutions and an anarchistic belief in the importance of the individual to make his or her own decisions about life, rather than simply to accept tradition and the institutional philosophy. I do think that although the films that came after IF are really quite different, that this is something that they have in common. They are different because after all, as the years go by, we change. And the idealism of youth, or the early years, if you like, does usually change into skepticism or, as in the case, say, of Britannia Hospital, certainly a, a pessimism, I think, about science and the joys or benefits which scientific invention is likely to bring to the human race. I think there's always a tendency, perhaps too much, to make the subject of these films of mine the state of Britain, the state of the nation. And there's no doubt that in a way, uh, the school in IF, the many institutions reflected in O Lucky Man, the hospital in Britannia Hospital, do strongly reflect Britain and Britain's historical situation. slowly downhill. Britain has changed a lot in the last 50 years. One has to remember that these are the years in which Britain lost its empire and Britain is no longer an imperial power. This, in my view, has made the British, the English particularly, very insecure and much less able to take criticism or to have fun poked at them. Britannia Hospital is a pretty black comedy. The picture of Britain that is presented by the hospital, the fact that the gentleman from Buckingham Palace is a dwarf, that he's accompanied by a woman who is in fact a man, the fact that there is a member of the royal family, the fact that the left and the right are equally made fun of in the film, all these things I think 
added up to a criticism which even if British people tend to make jokes about them in the pub, they don't expect to see on the cinema screen. And very interestingly, I found that abroad, audiences have understood a film like Britannia Hospital, not as an attack on Britain, but very much as an attack on institutions, if you like, on conventions. And one of the best responses to the film I ever received was, in fact, a letter from Andrzej Wajda from Poland, who said that Britannia Hospital reminded him of a Polish film. And I did take this to be a compliment, as I think it was meant. And that the only criticism he had was that perhaps there were too many targets in the film. I think this is probably true, that I took the opportunity of being able to make a film to, if you like, lash out at very many different objects of satire. In that way, Britannia Hospital is a very different kind of film, I think, from O Lucky Man, which didn't have, in a way, such a simple emotional viewpoint and in making O Lucky Man I did want to make a picaresque film in which the audience wouldn't know what exactly was going to happen to the hero next and was if you like a satirical picture of human nature which starts off with Mick its hero in pursuit of success and ends up with him in pursuit of goodness there isn't any simple answer to this search. Malcolm McDowell, of course, from If up to Britannia Hospital, appears in all these films, not playing really the same character, even if it is given the same name. And I think this has always quite irritated people, and particularly critics who like to have clear-cut answers to their questions. There aren't clear-cut answers to these questions. Perhaps one of the difficulties about the films is that they do ask their audiences to think. But that's always been part of my temperament, if you like, to ask questions. Not always the most popular thing to do. Um, do you think there's going to be any coffee put well, into these know. cups? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know. Is anyone here? No. There doesn't seem to be anybody That's around. Of course, people, and especially critics, always want one to conform to their image of oneself. They really want you always to make the same picture and they get very annoyed if you come up with something that doesn't conform to their idea of what one is or what one does. But really life isn't like that. Um, life to individuals or life to artists. And as an artist I think that one does of course make different kinds of film as certainly a director in the theatre will direct different kinds of plays, as I have directed, say, Chekhov, David Storey, or Joe Orton, to name a few, apart from Shakespeare. Well, of the films I've done, a film like In Celebration, which is a version made for the American Film Theatre of the first David Storey play that I directed, is completely different from a film like If or Britannia Hospital. I think that In Celebration as a film is very much a reminder of what royal court acting was like with people like Alan Bates, Jimmy Bolam, Constance Chapman, beautifully, beautifully acted. But you can't fit all these films together and think that they're going to reflect the same aspects 
of one's personality. They are individual works and they have to be evaluated according to your own intelligence, your own sensitivity for what they themselves are. I think it was Renoir who said, you know, and I think he was quite right, that a film is anything that's projected onto a screen and is worth looking at. Well, I think that one never really knows who has influenced one, or it's very difficult to be sure. And amongst British directors, I think I would have to mention the name of Humphrey Jennings, which is an interesting uh, name and a remarkable talent, chiefly because, or to a great extent, because so few British people have ever heard of him. He was a documentary director, to use a rather disputed term, his films had nothing whatever to do with documentaries as they are made for television today. But he was, in, shall I say, a poetic director. And his, uh, his greatest films were made during the war, were inspired, I think, by the wartime feeling that brought the British people together, gave them a unified sense of community and purpose. And certainly there are films that anybody who wants to know both about cinema and about British cinema ought to see. And I mean, listen to Britain, A Diary for Timothy, and Fires Were Started. In addition, I would say that Jennings was an artist who used film as an artist will paint a picture with a great and individual sense of style, of both composition and of cutting. What's your plans now? Oh. I mean, it really would be a tragedy if you... My dear fellow, it's charming of you to say that, but it's uh, very removed from reality. Well, I know how difficult it is to raise money, but, but is that the, the sole problem to overcome? Well, I think there's a little problem of uh, personality as opposed to talent. Mm. And I think that, um, I think I've always made a big mistake in um, talking a great deal too frankly. And I mean that um, quite seriously. I think it is a mistake. People don't like it and it makes people insecure. Perhaps you know what I mean. I think the kind of truth that Jennings compulsively aimed for is the kind of truth that I would be happy to feel had been experienced by people who've seen the films I've made. You do sound as though the fight's gone out of you, and now, I mean, well, isn't given that... up on making films, is that true? No, it certainly isn't. <clears throat> Actually, I, I don't think that um, I've given up. I think that I probably would be capable of making a film better now than I have in the past. But to the extent that it has been a, um, a struggle, and that it becomes more of a struggle today, uh, to that extent, I have been forced to become inactive. In the old days, you know, to do something um, individual or daring or exceptional was regarded as a justification of one's work as an artist. Very unfortunately, today, in the era of television and the triumph, I suppose we must say, of the capitalistic system, what really matters is success. 24, take one. Okay. Liz, you do sound as though the fight's gone out of you when you say that... Um... Look, life is finite. We all come to an end, you know. What do you mean? You can't go on fighting. 
uh, like uh, a juvenile, like a young man, when you reach a certain age, you know it all. And uh, of course the fight goes out of you. And if you, if the fight does not go out of you, you're very lucky. I think in many ways those were better days. And I'm very glad that the films still exist and can be seen as a reminder of what can be done in cinema. Now what? What I think we should do is go back to the beginning. Beginning of what? The beginning of the day, right to the beginning. We can't do it all again. We have to get out of here or the British Council will really have to pay through the nose. <laughs> <you know? laughs>